Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Don alcoholic. Thanks, Sheldon. And as we come out of the first step, and as Sheldon so eloquently put it, and realize that we are screwed, and that there's no real hope to uh, make matters worse, to add insult to injury, uh, we find out that the solution is God. And that's difficult for many of us. And we all have different reasons, but you know, it's prejudice. It's we've turned our back on him. It's I believed it once, but I've been gone a long time. It's our experience, this reservoir of information, this cart filled with pitiful and comprehensible demoralization. It's the things we're embarrassed about. If there is a God, I don't want to meet him. He's probably a little upset with me. I haven't been treating his kids very well lately. And uh, so I have a problem with the whole idea of it. But good sponsorship, I think as much as anything, rears its head where the second step is concerned. And it takes my intellect out of the process. You know, I got a sponsor assigned to me my second night in Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know that wasn't done in AA. I didn't know anything about AA. I was in rough physical shape. I'm detoxing in the rooms. And the next thing I know, without my permission, I might add, um, I have a sponsor. I have a home group. I have a set of meetings I'll be going to. And uh, the reason I know that is he had a meeting director. And he circled me and said, these are the meetings you'll be going to. And, and, and I just assume that's what's done in AA. I don't know any different. I didn't know that uh, some places they tell you to check things out. And, uh, you know, that <laughs> we tell new people funny things, too, about sponsorship. It, it, it's very funny. One of my favorite things that we tell new people that just got here is uh, they hear about sponsorship, and we, we, we tell them to get a sponsor. In fact, every uh, meeting I go to, there's something about sponsorship in the format. Get a sponsor, get a sponsor, get a sponsor. And we say things like this. Find somebody that has what you want. Huh. I wonder what I would have wanted my second night of recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Maybe a pharmaceutical rep with a spare Cadillac, you know? Because <laughs> I'd have never picked the guy that they assigned to me, you know what I mean? Because he was everything I wasn't, you know? Soft-spoken, slight of frame, bald of head, wire rim glasses, and, and he was in love with God. And he was not a guy that got that memo about not hitting the new person with God too early. You don't want to scare him out of AA. Because he was talking about God the first time we met, what God did for him, what God did for you, what God did for them, what God was going to do for me. And he was expecting a miracle. And he was on fire with Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll tell you what I remember about him and the way he presented this God idea to me. It wasn't what he said so much as the way he said it. Because what he had at his disposal was spiritual enthusiasm. He was a guy that had found an answer and he was giving it away that night. He didn't really care what anybody thought about that. He wasn't going to dim his light for me. He was going to talk about exactly what had happened for him in his own words and his own experience. And there's something about being in front of somebody that has that spiritual enthusiasm, that's a man that's found a real answer. As the book says, armed sufficiently with facts about himself who's found this solution can genuinely win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a couple of hours. And the book also says, until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. So it wasn't what he said, it was the way he said it. And a guy I just met in a couple of hours had my confidence. For some reason, I wanted his approval. I didn't know why. And I remember my you know, third night in Alcoholics Anonymous, my second night with this man as a sponsor. Now the meetings are over. We've gone to a couple meetings that night. We're hanging out together. And he's talking to me about what he wants me to do when I get home that night. He says, when you get home tonight, I'd like you to get down on your knees next to your bed. And I'd like you to thank God for keeping you sober today. And I interrupt him. And I go, well, I don't believe in God. And he didn't even miss a beat. He goes, that's okay. He believes in you. So get down on your knees. <laughs> and thank God for keeping you sober. Now, tomorrow when you get up, and I interrupt him a little more forcefully, you're not listening to me. I don't believe in God. And he goes, oh, man, if you keep interrupting me, kid, this is going to take all night. Let me finish. He goes, when you get up in the morning, I want you to ask God to keep you sober that day. And I said, well, listen, I don't believe in God. He goes, listen, stand up. What? Stand up. So I stood up. He goes, great, sit down. I sat down. He goes, your knees work. You can pray. And I said, what? You, you just want me to take this action? You want me to do this prayer and I don't even believe in it? And he goes, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I want you to do. And he said, humor me. He goes, take an action you don't believe in. Humor me. He goes, have you ever prayed? Have you ever prayed on a regular basis? I said, well, no. I know. He goes, how do you know it doesn't work? I don't know. I'm just smart that way. Okay, we're not going to do this anymore. You don't get to tell me it doesn't work until you start to do it. So now I'm at home, 
feeling silly. You know, it's funny, I would lay in the gutter drunk and judge you as you walk by. <laughs> Where'd you get those ugly shoes? Yeah. Now I'm sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. I got a sponsor in a home group. I'm being asked to do something as simple as say a few words on my knees next to my bed. And I got the door locked, the drapes closed. <laughs> And I'm not thinking deep spiritual thoughts like this. God exists. Is there a common father and we're all his children? Does he really care about us? Could this be true? I'm thinking this. Should I be dressed for this? Should I? <laughs> That's my big spiritual question. I get to the clubhouse the next night. My sponsor asked me if I prayed. I said, yes, I did. But I got a question for you. He said, what's that? I said, well, should I be dressed when I pray? You know, it was the first time I saw that look on his face that I was going to see many times over the next few years. And <laughs> you know that look where he, rem he, he used to ask his sponsor, why do I get all the sick ones? And his sponsor told him why. And he just shook his head and grabbed his forehead like he always did. And he said, listen, God made you. He knows everything about you. I just don't want to ever hear about it again. And uh, <laughs> so now I'm praying. In Bill's story, Bill's coming to the end of his rope. He's drinking himself to death, and he knows it. He has no illusions that he's ever going to be sober. He's been to town's hospital a couple of times and gets drunk shortly after being released. And he knows that sobriety isn't in the cards for him. And he's sitting there on a Saturday, and he's thinking with some satisfaction that he has enough gin hit around the house that he can make it through the entire day. And there's a sadness as he's reflecting on his life and he's thinking about his wife and how much he loved her and how sad it is that it's going to end this way for him. Because after all, there was much love at one time in their, in their life. And while he's doing that, the phone rings and it shakes him out of his reverie and it picks it up and it's a childhood friend of his that he hasn't heard from in a long time and it's Ebby T. And he excites Bill because Ebby's an old drinking buddy. And he's thinking, oh, this is great. Just, this is just what I need at this time and Ebby will come and Ebby will drink with me and we'll rekindle and we'll tell the old stories about the old days and it, it'll be an oasis in the sea of futility. And Ebby shows up at Bill's house and uh, he's fresh skinned and, and clear eyed and there's something about him that's different and Bill can't put his finger on it and he pours Ebby a drink and he pushes it towards Ebby and Ebby pushes the drink back and he says, I'm not drinking. And Bill goes, well, you're not drinking. What's this about? And Ebby says, I got religion. And Bill goes, oh, so that's it. Last summer, alcoholic crackpot, now he's got religion. He goes, that's okay, let the old boy rant. Besides, my gin will last longer than his ranting. And what Ebby starts to do is he doesn't rant, and he doesn't preach, and he doesn't deliver a sermon. He starts talking about it in a simple way about this God that he found in his life and what's happened to him. And Bill's intrigued, and he's listening to this, but every time that Ebby starts to get a foothold in Bill's intellect, starts to kind of take down Bill's defenses and Bill's starting to have a little bit of open-minded about the idea of God. Bill's old prejudice rises up in him. And he thinks about the chicanery of man and man's inhumanity to man and all the wars and all the poverty and all the famine in the world. And he pushes away the idea of God. And, and Ebby doesn't get defeated by that. He just starts again. And this goes on for a long time, for hours. And if you've ever talked to a new guy about God and they're belligerent and they're argumentative, you know that it can wear you out. And I think it wore Ebby out. And I don't think out of spirituality, and I don't think out of a great relationship with God, I think out of frustration from talking to a drunk who's still drinking, Ebby said something that I believe changed the course of history for you and me. And what he said to Bill, I believe out of frustration was, I don't know, Bill, why don't you choose your own conception of God? Now, Bill Wilson, grandiose egomaniac alcoholic of the, my type, thinks this to himself. Choose my own conception of God. You know, that's a great idea. You know, it's about time somebody let me do this. <laughs> and at that moment, the hoop that you and I have to jump through just got a lot bigger. What my sponsor did on my third night of sobriety by asking me to go home and praise, he had me actually starting to take the actions contained in the second step before I knew I was working the second step. He knew that as long as I did the action, that the rest would take care of itself. But as long as I was stuck behind an intellectual fortress that I'm not going to do this until I understand it, I can't do it till I believe in it, I can't do it till it makes sense to me, there'd be no progress. Page 44 of We Agnostics, the second paragraph. To one who feels he is an atheist or agnostic, such an experience seems impossible, 
but continue as he is means disaster, especially if he's an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. To be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. For who? For us. So Memorial Day Monday this year, by ambulance, my brother-in-law Robert, my wife's brother, was brought to our house and Robert was dying and he's been dying for some time and uh, we decided to bring him home and have hospice at our home. And the last two weeks of his life, he, uh, he spent at our house and uh, we waited on him hand and foot and we spent many sleepless nights with him and uh, we held his hand and we kissed his forehead and we told him that he was loved and we tried to create an environment so his last days on this earthly plane were surrounded by people that loved him. And if I'd gone to Robert and I said, Robert, I know you're dying from a, a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body and it's a progressively fatal disease that you have, which he did. And I said, you know, you can beat this thing by living on a spiritual basis. I don't think Robert would have argued with me. But one of the things about alcoholism is it's the only disease that we don't think we have. That we believe it might kill us, but it's not going to kill us today, right? Only an alcoholic is going to have problems with this idea that living by spiritual principles will serve the problem. On page 45, second paragraph down, it says, lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves." And then one of the short sentences in the big book, obviously. <laughs> but where and how are we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself that will solve your problem. I thought you were going to teach me not to drink. I thought my problem was I drank too much whiskey, and when I drink too much whiskey, I can't stop, and I take absurd actions, and I hurt the people around me, including myself. I thought my problem was drinking. Now, I'm in the fourth chapter of the book, We Agnostics, and it tells me that my problem is lack of power, and that if I'm going to live happily and usefully whole, I'm going to have to find this power, and that this entire book is about finding that power. That's what it just said in black and white. So I'm finding out that my misconceptions about sobriety, about my drinking, about my alcoholism, and even about Alcoholics Anonymous, by the time I get to the fourth chapter, I'm finding out that I was wrong about a lot of stuff. You see, I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, and self-pity. Any one of those things, which is the alcoholic propulsion system that we're going to talk about in the third step, but any one of those things can kill me dead. But my favorite is self-delusion. Now, self-delusion is something, a delusion is a false psychotic belief. It means something that lives in my head. It's something that I think is true that just isn't true. A self-delusion is something I think about myself to be true, and I'm the only one. Nobody else thinks that about me. How many people have you known that said, you know, I'm really a kind person. You're thinking, who are you talking about, you know? <laughs> and one of the self-delusions that I had was that I'm actually a wonderful human being. Just ask me. I just drink too much sometimes. If you took the booze away from me, I'm a wonderful human being. My first grand sponsor used to delight in telling me Listen, whiskey didn't make you what you were. It exposed you for what you were. And I disagreed with that. Now, I'm quick to tell somebody I'm a liar, a cheat, and a thief in a drunken state, but I did not believe I was capable of those things in a sober state until I continued to lie, cheat, and steal sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started to become open-minded that this thing called alcoholism is a lot, about a lot more than drinking. I started to become open-minded to the idea that perhaps the ticket they tear at the door to Alcoholics Anonymous to get in this joint is I have to stop drinking to start working the rest of the program. That that in it of itself is not a solution. But I thought it was because I've been brainwashed by the time I get here that I just have to stop drinking and everything will be fine. Now the best persuader that there's maybe more to the problem than that is what? The irritable, restless, discontent nature that overtakes me sober in Alcoholics Anonymous with a sponsor, a home group, going to 14 meetings a week, setting up, cleaning up, going out for coffee, doing all the little things that everybody says to do in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm going crazy in AA, doing what I think is suggested. But what I'm doing is I'm participating in the activities of the fellowship. I am not participating in the actions contained in the program of action described as Alcoholics Anonymous in the big book. 
So now I start to have this idea that lack of power is my dilemma. How do I know that? Well, I'm doing the best I can. My God, I'm living in Alcoholics Anonymous. Seven days a week, two meetings a day, setting up, cleaning up. Yes, sir. No, sir. What can I do? How can I be helpful? My goodness, I have never made an effort this strong towards my recovery. And I'm just as crazy. I'm just as crazy as I was without Alcoholics Anonymous. So I start to understand lack of power and what it looks like. What does that look like in my life? I don't have the power to fix what's wrong with me. I start to understand that I'm going to need more than the human power where this is concerned. Page 46 in the big book. Yes, we have agnostic temperament have had these thoughts and experiences. Let us make haste to reassure you. We found that as soon as we were able to set aside prejudice, it doesn't mean that I don't have prejudice. It doesn't mean that I'm not willing to argue with you about God and how he doesn't exist and all that. It just means for five minutes, kid, can you set it aside? Can you give it a rest? We know you don't believe in God. We know you think this is all a bunch of spiritual hooey. Can you set that aside for five minutes? Okay, I'm going to set that aside and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves. We commence to get results. What are the results? God, I don't want it to be true, but I can't, I, I can't deny it. I get up in the morning after being on my knees praying to a God I don't believe in, and I feel better. Do I believe in God? No. Do I feel better? Yes. I get on my knees, on my bed. I ask God, I thank God for keeping me sober that day. Do I believe in God? No. Do I feel better? Yes. It's a funny thing about feeling. You know, everything that every human being does from the time they wake up in the morning to the time they go to bed, they, they're doing it to produce a feeling. Everything we do, where we chose to work for a living, who we decide is going to be our life partner, what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous, all these things, there's a process going on. We're trying to take actions that what? Make us happy. Nobody goes through their day going, I think I'll do this. That should make me miserable. That'll be good. <laughs> the problem with the alcoholic, at least this type of alcoholic, is I think I'm really good at making myself happy. How do I know that? Because I never stop thinking of ways to do it. <laughs> what does my experience tell me about my ability to make myself happy? I suck at it. And that's hard to explain to people when you're back in the ER and you have the same ER doctor stitching up your head, only it's the other side of the head. And he goes, weren't you just in here Tuesday? And you go, yeah, that was, that was me, funny story. Uh, and, uh, and he asks you what happened. You can't tell him the truth, but what's the truth? Well. Just trying to make myself happy. <laughs> <laughs> kind of overshot the mark a little bit. And, uh, but what were we doing out there? What were we doing with all that nonsense? What were we doing with all that drinking and all that? We were trying to change the way we felt. Why did we want to change the way we felt? Because we didn't like the way it made us feel. But when it suggested to us that this relationship with God and taking these simple spiritual actions might actually make us happy, our intellect <laughs> slams that door closed. So is the second step about belief or is it about open-mindedness? Oh, I'll tell you, I've known a lot of people to claim the belief, but you couldn't get them to do anything. And I've seen a lot of people that claim they didn't believe, but they had open-mindedness, which produced willingness so they could take actions they didn't believe in, and they commenced to get results immediately. So the belief isn't really important. It's about the open-mindedness. So was I open-minded? I acted like a guy, like Sheldon said, a guy that was willing to believe in God. What does a guy that's willing to believe in God do? He takes the actions we talk about in Alcoholics Anonymous. And when does this stop? Never. What happens if it stops? We start to lose the spiritual magic. We start to lose the things that we found when we were new. I'll tell you a story. And this is, I'm 15 years sober, right? And I go to a lot of meetings. I've always gone to a lot of meetings. And I'm in a meeting about 15 years sober, and a lot of new guys in this meeting. It's a discussion meeting, and they're kind of, it's a kind of a loose format. I just happen to be there. And they're calling a new guy after new guy after new guy. And I'm kind of sitting there with my 15 years, you know, on the fast track, the bleeding deacon. You know, I know how AA should be run, and sitting in my throne of contempt, you know. And uh, they call on this one new guy, and he goes, yeah, you know what? Uh, 32 days sober, you know, and everybody applauds. I'm like, yeah, that's terrific, you know. You talk to me when you got 33 days, you know. And, uh, and so the guy goes, yeah, and I left the halfway house this morning, you know, I'm going to that job, that crappy job I got, you know, and I'm feeling bad, you know, I was feeling bad this morning, you know, I got a lot of regret, got a lot of things I did wrong in my life, you know, and I was thinking about my family, particularly my grandfather. You know, my grandfather, he loved me. 
that man loved me, you know, and I, all I did was I stole from him and I lied to him and, you know, he never got to see me sober. It breaks my heart. And as I'm walking along thinking about my grandfather, this white pigeon flies out of nowhere and it lands right in front of me. I mean, it made me stop in my tracks and I looked at the white pigeon. I said, hello, white pigeon. And the pigeon looked up at me and it went, cool, cool, cool. And it looked me right in the eyes. I mean, it looked right through me. This white pigeon, it didn't fly away. It just stood there staring at me. And in that moment, I knew, I knew that was my grandfather. And I gotta tell you, it was a hell of a God shot. And it raised my spirits and I thought, my, my grandfather, he knows I got sober, he's in heaven, watching me get sober. And I said, I gotta stay sober for my grandfather, you know, and I'm good. it's good to be at a meeting today. And everybody applauds and it's so spiritual. And I'm thinking, oh, I just, you gotta love the newcomer. Oh my God, oh yeah, yeah. God tapped your grandfather, turned him into a pigeon, sent him down to say hi to you, yeah, okay. And they call on the next guy. Next guy goes, well, you know, I'm leaving the halfway house today and I'm going to that job that I hate. You know, and I don't have any money. I don't have any money because I don't get paid for two days, you know, and I smoke. So I'm thinking, great, I'm going to be irritable, restless, and discontented. This job I don't like is I don't need cigarettes. And I don't want to borrow cigarettes because I've been bumming cigarettes and now guys are teasing me about bumming cigarettes. I don't want to. And I'm walking down the street and I'm pissed off. I look down, there's $10. $10 sitting in the middle of the sidewalk. I look around, there's nobody around. And I look up and I go, thank you, God. And I pick up the $10 and I was able to buy cigarettes. And I had cigarettes a day for work. And it was a real God shot, I got to tell you. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> so now God's up in heaven. He's going, look, Billy needs 10 bucks. We don't want him to have a bad day. We'll just float this sucker down. <laughs> right about there. And Billy, perfect. <laughs> well, running the universe is tough work. And I'm sitting there and I'm judging these two newcomers with their pigeon and $10 bill God shots. A little voice comes in my head and it says, when was the last time you had a God shot? And I thought about it, I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember the last time I had a God shot. And the voice said, did you used to get those all the time when you were new? All the time. And I asked myself, what is the new man doing in his 30, 60, 90 days of sobriety that I no longer was doing at 15 years of sobriety. And then I realized it. They were looking for God. I had become so comfortable that I had a relationship with God, that I believed in God, and I was quick to talk to you about it. I was quick to explain the second step to you, the third step to you, the seventh step to you, the eleventh step to you. I can tell you all about God. What do you want to know? Having a problem with your spiritual relationship? I can tell you all about it. Yet guys that are 30 days sober are having a more intimate experience with this power greater than their self that we talk about than I am at 15 years because they're doing the thing that I forgot to do that I was taught in my first 30 days that we have to seek. At 15 days of sobriety, I made a conscious effort that from that day forward, I was going to look for God in all the things. I was going to look for God in my home. I was going to look for God at work. I was going to look for God when I was driving. I was going to look for God in the eyes of my friends. I was going to look for God for the eyes of my enemies. I was going to look for God. And I'm not perfect at it, but I'll tell you what, I see God all the time because I'm looking for him and he's everywhere. But if I don't look, I won't see him. And I forgot that lesson and you can forget that in Alcoholics Anonymous. We talk about the second slip, like this is something you do when you're new, right? You come to believe that the power greater than yourself could restore you to sanity, oh no. I mean, I got second step issues going on in my life right now, I won't bore you with. But the reality is, do I believe that God is the answer? That's a short form, the second step. Am I willing to stay in that process where I can come to believe, where I can relearn again and again that quite important, as the big book says, quite important was the discovery that living by spiritual principles would solve all of my problems. Do I believe that? Sheldon already talked about the second step question on page 47. I want to talk about why the second step question becomes so easy. Let's go to page 55. First paragraph, yet we have been seeing another kind of flight of spiritual liberation from this world, people who rose above their problems. They said God made these things possible and we only smiled. We had seen spiritual release, but we liked to tell ourselves it wasn't true. Actually, we were fooling ourselves, for deep down inside every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things, but in some form or another, it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as man 
himself. We finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of her makeup, just as much as the feelings we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. He was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. In the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. It was so with us. You drop back on the page 53 and it says, faced with the proposition that God either is everything or else he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What was our choice to be? So the second step becomes a lot easier if I come to believe that deep down inside every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured. I may not be able to feel it clearly. I may be, not be able to see it clearly because it may be obscured by what? By pomp, by circumstance. I'm in so much trouble, it cuts me off from God. I'm full of so much resentment, it cuts me off from God. I'm full of so much fear, it cuts me off from God. I have so much guilt and remorse, it cuts me off from God. It may be obscured by circumstance. It may be obscured by worship of other things. If only I had the right girl, the right money, the right job, then I'd be okay. I'm worshiping false idols, I don't know that about myself. But in the final analysis, deep down inside every man, woman, and child, it's only there that he may be found. So what I'm looking for, I'm looking with. I no longer have to bar my door and sequester myself at a table. And when God shows up and knocks on the door, I don't have to scream at the door, go away. I'm looking for God. He's already with me. He's as much a part of me as the feelings I would have for a friend. So I start looking at this differently. What if that's true? This is the part about the seeking. We give ourselves permission to ask questions. What if it's true? What if there is a God, individual to me, individual to you, but we're all connected? What if he is with me right now? What if he's been with me always? What if I never knew it? What if I started to live my life like he's here right now? I don't have to do anything. I don't have to earn his respect. I don't have to earn his love. I don't have to have the right, earn the right to have a relationship with me. What if he loves me? What if it's all true what they're saying to me? How magnificent would that be? Can I set aside my prejudice? Can I set aside my fear for five minutes? Can I just go out on a limb for just a minute? And can I say, what if it was true? What if he was here deep down inside me? What if what I'm looking for my whole life I've been looking with and I just didn't know it? What other literature backs that up? We go to the back of the book in Spiritual Experience on page 567. And they were talking about in the first few paragraphs here, the white light experience. And the problem with the white light experience, that Bill Wilson had this white light experience, our co-founder, so other people felt like if they didn't have one, they were getting cheated. Because you know alcoholics. <laughs> Some of us will go out to dinner tonight after this, and we will order the same thing. And if Sheldon and I happen to order a T-bone steak, and we both order it medium rare, when the server brings it, he will look at my plate, and I will look at his. And we will be interested in only one thing, is yours bigger? That's it. And so when we hear that Bill Wilson had a white light spiritual experience, we want one too. But what it's telling us is most of us have what uh, Williams James, the philosopher, said, we had the educational variety because they developed slowly over a period of time. Uh, bottom paragraph on page 567 says, among our rapidly growing membership of thousands of alcoholics, such transformations, the white light, experience, though frequent, are by no means the rule. Most of our experiences are what the psychologist William James calls the education variety because they develop slowly over a period of time. This is what's important to me. Quite often, friends of the newcomer are aware of the difference long before he is himself. When I was new in Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the most important questions I ever learned to ask my sponsor was this, how am I doing? And if my sponsor said, you're doing good, kid, it had to be enough for me that day. Because there were days I didn't feel like I was doing good. There were days I felt like I was crazy. There were days I felt everybody in AA was doing better than me. There were days where I felt like I should be better than this by now. And I could still suffer from that today. So it's very important that we understand that quite often the people around us are seeing the change long before we do it ourselves. And you know, that makes sense because when we were out there drinking, tearing our lives apart, who knew it first, our families or us? Who knew at first the people in our neighborhood are us? Our boyfriends and girlfriends are us. Weren't we always surprised when they first started showing up in their life, our lives and they started talking to us about their drinking? You know, I love you, you're a great guy, but Jesus Christ, even a train stop sometimes, kid, you know. <laughs> and we were always surprised, weren't we? Like, why are you coming at me with this? I'm just having a little bit of fun and we had no idea what they were seeing. 
Because quite often the friends of this newcomer were aware of the change, the destructive change in my life long before I was myself. And that happens when we get well. People around us are going to notice this long before we understand what's happening to us. He finally realizes he's undergone a profound alteration in his reaction to life. Isn't that what I want? Don't I need a profound alteration in my reaction to life? What's my old reaction to life? I can't take it. I can't live life on life's terms. I can do it for the short haul, but when I try to do it for the long haul, you know what happens when I'm sober? I'm rendered irritable, restless, and discontent. Something's got to change. Something big has to happen in my life or I'm not going to make it. I can't take the pain of sobriety. Something has to change in my reactions to life. But I experienced this profound alteration in my reaction to life. How do you know that's happened? Something happens in your life that's happened a thousand times, a hundred times, and you know it. And intuitively, you act differently. Something that you used to get defensive about, something you used to defend yourself about, something you used to go on the attack about, something you go into self-pity about, rolls off you like water off a duck's back. And you don't even think about the moment it's later that night you're laying in bed and you go, that's weird. That usually eats my lunch, and it was no big deal. And you'll go, huh, that's a profound alteration in my reaction to life. <laughs> that such a change could hardly have been brought about by himself alone. What often takes place in a few months could seldom have been accomplished by years of self-discipline. With few exceptions, our members find they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. Most of us think this awareness of power greater than ourselves is the essence of spiritual experience. Our more religious members call it God consciousness. I have tapped an unsuspected inner resource I presently identify with my own conception of God. Why was it unex unexpected? I never used it. I never looked for it. I never, ever in my life ask the most important question I'm allowed to ask as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You see, all my life I asked, what do you want me to be? What do they want me to be? What do I think I should be? I never asked, what would God have me be? Never. And so by asking that simple question, what I found is because if the book, if the book is true, then deep down inside every man, woman, and child is a fundamental idea. When I ask that question because God is already here, what will happen? I will get an answer. And so what starts to build my second step experience is asking the question and finding that there's an answer. There's always been an answer. I just never asked the question. I have this unexpected inner resource. I can go to God right now when I'm new, when I'm five days sober, when I'm 50 days sober, when I'm 10 years sober. When I, I can do it right now. I can close my eyes. I can get quiet. I can be in any situation about my life, and I can go, okay, I know what I want to do. I know what they want me to do. I know what, I'm going to set all that aside for a minute. I'm going to ask this. What would you have me do, Dad? And I will get an answer, which proves there is this unsuspected inner resource. So what do we start to do? We start to seek. And because we are sober, we have this great gift. And it's not the physical sobriety. Here's the, that, that's, like I said, that's the ticket we tear at the door to get in here. Here's the gift now. For a lot of us that have been drunken out of our minds for so long, we are now sober. And we do what we do, and we get what we get, and we're able to remember it. We do what we do and we get what we get and we're able to remember it. So we start to pay attention. Well, I was really a jerk yesterday. Were you connected with God? No, I was not. You know, I was pretty good yesterday. Didn't miss any opportunities. I had a good spirit. I didn't get tired easily. How was your conscious contact? Not bad, pretty good actually. And we start to really find that the proof is in the pudding. We start to track. How does my life go when I'm connected with this power and how does my life go? And we don't even know if we're connected or not. We don't even know if it's happening. We're just trying. We're slowing down enough to ask the question, what would God have me do? What is a guy who's come to believe that a power greater than himself could restore him to sanity? What does he do? He seeks. How does he seek? By asking questions, by asking for guidance, by looking for the existence of God in all areas of our life. And when we stay in that process, what we find is what the book says in We Agnostics. We find that God does not make too tough terms with those that earnestly seek him. What we're going to look for, we're going to look with. Let's take Thanks for listening. Please support the channel by liking and subscribing.